This is mining in the Amazon rainforest. So we're mining bauxite to make aluminium, which we use in huge quantities in our buildings. And the demand for raw materials is going up and up and up. The construction industry alone uses over 40% of raw materials. And we're doing is we're damaging precious environments like this for every time that we do and build and we think about these things. And then we put all our effort and our time and our resources into building all these amazing buildings. But all too often, they end up like this. And sometimes within 30 years or even less, we end up with a pile of rubble, twisted metal, plastics and glass all mixed in. And what can we do with this? We say that we recycle over 80% of the raw materials, oh sorry, the resources that we use here and the, and the demolition waste. But actually, it's mostly downcycled to a lower grade product or material. So I went to visit where, uh, where they re reprocess waste. And it's amazing, it's these huge buildings and they're very noisy, they're smelly, they're dusty. And it's very, very, very simple and primitive. And I thought it would all be mechanized and there'd be lots of machines. But actually, there's lots of people pulling out bits of plastic and, and metal and trying to sort it all out. So it's a very, very simplified process. And really, we're wasting all this stuff. And we could be using it a lot better. So it really made me think that, that we're really locked into this idea of digging some stuff out of the ground. We use it for a while and we throw it away. We're very much in this linear economy. And I thought, and I looked it up, and I read about it, and I found out that there's this great circular economy idea. And I was inspired by Cradle to Cradle and lots of other ideas and lots of other TED Talks, thinking, I think we could do this and I'd try and apply it to the built environment. So I've written a book, and, and, and I've tried to capture some of these ideas and apply it to what we can do in buildings and keep it really simple. So, so basically, how we do this... Um, we need to think about the circular economy as this idea where we, we keep resources in motion and, and we keep the value of those materials for as long as we can. So that means for buildings that we need to retain, refit, refurbish, but then for the components of those buildings, we also need to be able to reclaim those for reuse. And then for the, the more complex components, the lights, the boilers, we need to be able to remanufacture those rather than throwing them away. And then lastly, we need to look at how we might recycle the technical components on one cycle, like metals and plastics that will go back to the manufacturer, be reprocessed, and go back into our buildings. And on the other cycle, we would look at biological materials like the timber and the, uh, the, the fabric that would then be used in our buildings uh, are having been grown and then would go back to the biosphere to be composted. And that would have to be not contaminated by any pollutants or other toxins in the process. And then we can look at lots of design principles, which I'll go through in a second. And then we'll also look at circular economy, business models, new ways of thinking about how we might buy stuff or maybe not buy it at all and not consume it, but maybe lease it or borrow it. And then we need to look at how we might turn waste not as something that we have to pay to get rid of, but as a resource. And the fundamental underlying principle of all this and how we think about buildings has to be looking at the different layers of the building and how we might treat each of those differently. Buildings are hugely complex things. It's not like a, like a mobile phone or something where traditionally the circular economy has been looking at, but it's looking at something like the, the structure and the foundation that might be there for 100 years. So we need to make that long life, loose fit, adaptable. Whereas the interiors of the building might only be there for two or three years, and if we don't like the colour of the carpet, we might rip that out after six months. So we need to think about how we make each of those layers independent and separable, but also how we might design buildings so that actually the, the structure might be there for a long period of time, like in this example, uh, and, and it's got generous floor-to-ceiling heights, and, and it can be adapted to different uses. And then the services are very accessible and easy to change because they have a short service life. And then how you might flex and adapt 
the interior spaces using very modular construction that allows you to, to meet the needs of the, of the latest occupants in the building. And then looking at design for adaptability, there's lots and lots of design principles around that, but there's a lot to be learned from buildings that have been round for a very long period of time and up to now have managed to dodge the wrecking ball and are not being demolished. And some of those things you can really see is the quality of the architecture and the, the great interior spaces, lots of space, lots of generous floor to ceiling heights, great use of light and daylight, but also how, um, how they might be reused and how, how we might be able to put new things into them. And what's really interesting is a lot of these buildings have, have been cherished and loved by the people that... that, that in their communities, and that's one of the reasons why they're still here with us today. And then we can think about how we might design for deconstruction. And that starts with assembly. So how do we assemble the buildings out of a kit of parts, speeding up the construction process and making buildings much more easy to, to, to deconstruct as well? So this building is actually designed to be disassembled. So the site is only available for four or five years. It doesn't use any foundations, it's got compacted ground, and then it just builds pads on top, and then the, a pin-jointed frame that you can take it all to bits again, and you can put it onto another site. And it's really this really interesting idea that not only does it make it easy to get the components back again, but it also means that we can take away the idea that the value of a building is tied to the value of the site. Now we have a building that is an asset in its own right, and it has that value. So whoever owns that can take it apart, keep it, and then move it on to another site. And we're using this principle now uh, with my organization to look at how we might give uh, affordable homes for people that haven't got a house and actually build these modular buildings that you can pop onto a site that's only available for two or three years. We call them meanwhile, meanwhile sites. And then, and then you can move it to another site, and it has four or five uses in it before it starts, starts to deteriorate. And then we need to think about those material flows and how we might use materials differently. And, and procuring materials for st that, that actually don't have lots of toxins and nasties in them that would pollute the interior environment so we can improve the air quality of the building straight away. Very important for health and well-being. But also, we, we, we make sure that we don't damage the environment in the process. And this building not only uses lots of timber for the structure and, and for the fabric of the building, but it also uses a straw thatch on the facade there as, as a, a cladding system. And that, that, that uses local people who, as a local trade, who can't work in the winter because it's all raining and they don't want their roofs replaced, so they thatch in the winter, they put these modules on, and it protects the building from the, from the wind and the rain, and it also acts as an extra insulating layer. And of course, you can return it to the biosphere at the end of life, and it can be composted. And then thinking about different business models. Well, this building uses the lighting, which is leased and rented directly from the manufacturer. So the manufacturer installed it and paid for that, they do the repair, they do the maintenance and the upgrade, and also they're responsible for all the bits at end of life. So you don't have to pay for getting rid of an, uh, the waste that comes off at the end of it. And they've also built in some ideas around energy efficiency. So they've set energy efficiency targets directly for the manufacturer. So it's a whole different way of thinking about how we might fit out and, and procure things. And then lastly, just worth mentioning the idea of, of how we might deal with the whole flow of materials and resources through our cities and through our buildings. And how we might firstly give components and materials an identity. So we need to list out what's in them. And that would be, you can put those into things like materials passports. And then you can put those things online as well. So we can have uh, online hubs that tell you what's going to come up from this building. It might be demolished in a year's time, and you can already have pre-sold those materials and those components. You've created a market for all, this, uh, all these resources that are coming out of your buildings. And really what we're doing is we're turning buildings into materials banks that you can deposit some materials now, and in the future you can take it out and you can withdraw 
and, and use it again. And the whole idea of this would be get away from this whole linear economy idea where we're subject to trying to find all these raw materials, having to pay for the costs and the volatility of those materials uh, and the supply risks that come with our global economy where we're trying to procure materials from all over the world in often very dangerous places. So what could this all mean if we put all this together? Well, first of all, we could have a building that could be assembled on site much more quickly. Therefore, you save money and time. You might end up with a more valuable asset because you've got a building that can flex and change to what the occupants want and the need at the time. You also have better air quality and a better environment for people if you use, particularly if you use lots of biological materials and, and get rid of all the toxins. And when you want to refit and refurbish that building, the market changes, let's say, no longer want an office, but there's lots of demand for hotels or residential. You've actually designed that building to be adapted and changed, so you've, you've got that benefit and then the saving. So hopefully you have a longer life for the building and it doesn't depreciate as quickly. And then lastly, and I like this, is that actually at the end of life, you get a positive residual value. So your building still has value when you don't want it anymore. And the demolition contractor will pay you for the privilege of taking down your building and getting all the materials back. Well, that was a nice idea at the end there. So what we're trying to get here is get to buildings that are, are better for the planet, are better for the people living in them. They can have a, a higher value right through their life. They should have low overall, lower costs during, their, during the whole life of the building. And really, I think I'd just like to, for you to think about if you're designing a building, or if you're buying a building, or if you're procuring bits, if you're procuring a carpet, a light fitting, is really to think about first, where do those bits come from, and what impact am I having in doing that? Is there a different way I could address the same need here? Do I even need this? But also to think about what's going to happen to that next. What's going to happen to that carpet, that building? Can we think about the next life and the life after that, and try and plan that in now? Uh, and hopefully that will, will create, start to create a more circular economy. And what I'd love to do is to be able to leave uh, a better, stronger legacy for, for future generations. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>